few years ago, I read the first Harry Potter book, this one. Uh, and then last year, I caught the last 30 minutes of the last movie. And so I know the beginning, I know the punchline, I know the end, I know the basics. If you want to go to the next slide, we have, we have the various characters. Harry's the hero in the body, bottom left, and then it's Hermione, the smart one, and then Ron, the trustworthy friend, and Dumbledore, who's the wise uh, counselor, and Malfo Malfoy, who's the jerk, you can tell by his scowl. Um, and, and then Snape down here is the teacher that everyone loves to hate. I mean, so there, I, I know all the characters. And, and uh, so I, I, know, I know the Harry Potter thing, right? There are a lot of books. Uh, these are all my wife's copies of the books. And so I, I, I asked her recently, uh, should I bother reading these? There's a lot of them, aren't there? I mean, this would take me a while to go ahead. If I was going to read the whole Harry Potter series, it would take at least a few days. And why should I bother reading them, I asked her. And I wish I could have captured the shock look on her face, because um, she was just flabbergasted. I told her, like, I know the characters. I know the ending. The bad guy loses, Voldemort, he who shall not be named. And uh, what, 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 why would I want to read the rest? Olivia explained, after she got over her shock, you read the rest of the books because the people, the characters become human. They become fleshed out. They become full and interesting. Uh, that uh, Harry's father, who, who died to save his, his son, uh, is not perfect. There's more story going on there. That Malfoy, the jerk, he, uh, he comes by it honestly. Right? He's never redeemed or transformed, but at least it, you, more and more you find out it's the family thing. Right? You, it's Snape, the teacher that everyone hates, ends up being the, the most interesting story in the, in the whole book. He, he is the one who uh, has this sacrifice in his background. It, it drives part of the stories. And, and you find that the, the good guys aren't perfect even as they try to do good, and the bad guys, well, they have their reasons, even if their reasons get a bit tortured. You read the rest of the books because that's where the meat is. Right? If I tell you that Harry Potter's the good guy of the Harry Potter series, and that the bad guy loses at the end of the book seven, is that, that's all you need to know, right? Well, there, there's a lot more going on there. You've got to read the whole series. And, and just for my own edification, who here has seen the movie, read the books or seen the movies? Okay. Excellent. So some people. In the year 110, there was a fellow named Marcion uh, who was born. And he uh, grew up and he read a different series, a longer series, you might say. There are more books in the series than seven. And the book that he was reading is what we would now call uh, the Old Testament. Now, the thing is, like 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about how uh, all of Scripture is useful for edification, etc., when that is written, the New Testament doesn't exist. It's all a bunch of letters that haven't been put together yet. And so when 2 Timothy talks about how all of Scripture is useful, what's it referring to? The Old Testament. All right. And so he reads the Old Testament because that's what they have. And he starts, he's one of the first people to put together the letters of Paul, get some of them in the same place. So that's impressive. Uh, but he is putting this together, and he, see, he reads the Old Testament, and he reads the letters of Paul, and he reads some of the Gospels. And what he finds is he doesn't see how the God of the Old Testament can be the God of the New Testament. He doesn't like the Old Testament, and he doesn't like it so much that he, he develops this plan. Right? He, he decides he doesn't have to have the entire series, so to speak. Right? If, you, if you want to skip parts of the Harry Potter series, Olivia tells me that in the fifth book, Harry is very whiny. And, and you could just skip that if you wanted to. I mean, that, that would be, if you're going to skip one, that'd be the one to skip. And he takes the, the same uh, theory of it. We don't need four Gospels. Why do you have four Gospels? That's overkill. You just need one Gospel. Just have the Gospel of Luke. Right? Redundant, right? Uh, you don't need all the letters of Paul. Get rid, just have 10 of them. And, and just ditch the entire Old Testament. Ditch it all. You don't have to have it. And then he went through and he edited um, what was left to remove all references to Abraham, to Jewishness, 
to the prophets. He got rid of the infancy narrative, uh, the birth of Jesus. He got anything that smacked of Israel or, or Jewish anything was just removed. And so he ends up with a, a much smaller Bible, so to speak. He called it the Apostolicon and the Evangelicon, which sounds really impressive in Greek. It, it's the good news and the letters. That's what he has. And so it's like to, his version of the Bible is like me telling you that Harry, Harry Potter's the good guy, Voldemort's the bad guy, and Harry wins. It's stripping it down to Jesus is the good guy, Paul has a few things to say about him, and Jesus wins. If we were to read what Marcion put together, what would we miss? Right, what we would miss, if we just skipped the entire Old Testament, what we would miss, we would miss how the Jews struggled and the, the challenge it is for them to learn to live as God's people in the wilderness. What a challenge it can be to learn to live by God's law. We would miss the way that expectations are just shattered in the Old Testament. Because you remember King Saul? King Saul is the tall military hero who you expect to be the great king. Yeah, he, he whiffs. Right? Who is the great king of the Old Testament? It's David, the young, youngest son, the, the, the sort of the twerp. Right? The twerp is the one who's the great king. It's not the amazing military leader. We would miss the prophets and the way that God returns to his people again and again and again with a stubborn hope that they can change this time. We would miss the pain of a heavenly father who had to discipline Israel when they go into exile. And we would miss the lamentations of Israel when they go into exile and they have to figure out how do we sing our songs in a foreign land. We would miss the resurrection of the Valley of Bones in Ezekiel, the way that God is desiring an entire people to be saved. We would miss the Psalms of joy and of hope, the love of the land, the intense love of the land that the Jewish people have. We would miss all of that if we missed the Old Testament. Right? If you don't read the Harry Potter series or the entirety of the Harry Potter series, it's a shame. I, I hope some of you do at some point read it. But if you don't read it, eh. All right? It's not going to be a horrible thing. You miss some good writing, you'll get over it. If we don't read the entirety of the series of the Old Testament and the New Testament, if we don't read the entire series of the Bible, there are parts that we will never be able to make sense of. Right? We read, I read you that, cha that first chapter out of Hebrews, and every other line was a quote from the New from, of, the, of the Old Testament in the New Testament. If you want to understand who Jesus is, you can't do it without the Old Testament. Right? It just doesn't work. If you, but more than that, the words that we find in the Old Testament show us how to do, how to say the things we need to say. Do you ever get angry? Right? How do you get angry and talk about it in a way that's faithful? Uh, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anger, and anger that is an argument with God. Right? You don't get angry at God and walk away. You, you take your anger to God, and you yell at God and shake your fist at the sky. Right? If you don't read the Old Testament, you will miss, how to, you will miss the, the words by which you figure out how to express grief. The, the lament, there's a whole book called Lamentations. Right? You will miss the words by which we learn to struggle with God. You ever just think God's done something profoundly stupid? Yes, right? God is going to take out Sodom, and there was Abraham arguing with God. How do you argue with God? If you don't read the entirety of the series, you miss the words by which we learn to faithfully dream and pray and hope. Right? We miss the opportunity to better know who God is, right? to better know like, who is the most tragic person in the Bible. It's God. God's the one who keeps on going back again and again. God is the one who is worried and stubborn and patient and gracious and wonderful and angry and forgiving. God is not some immutable, unchanging force. God is a heavenly father who sends his son. Right? You miss all of that if you just read a little bit of Luke and a few letters of Paul. With only Marcion's approach to, to Scripture... You end up with a shallow, shallow faith that, yes, that understands that Jesus is Lord and he forgives, but not much more. And a shallow faith is a faith that can be easily led astray into do, doing some very stupid things. Marcion 
undergirded the rise of what was called positive Christianity. In the 1930s Germany, the German state national church shifted it, right? Shifted so that it had a faith that denied that Jesus was Jewish, ditched the Apostles' Creed, and wasn't all that worried that Jesus was Lord. And if you want to find someone to undergird all of that, well, Marcion. Hitler's favorite theologian was Marcion. Because Marcion, it's pretty easy to ditch any... It, if you get rid of everything in the Bible that talks about the Jews being God's chosen people, it's pretty easy to do what he did, isn't it? Right? You start looking just at little bits of your favorite part of the Bible. You just read the Gospels and a little bit of Paul. And a shallow faith doesn't have the depth to withstand being led astray. I believe how we read the Bible matters, that we need the whole series. Right? You've got to read the whole series from beginning to end. It is how we deepen it, our faith. Now, there are parts of deepening our faith in reading that are challenging because I admit I have fallen asleep during the bagats. Right? Who has not fallen asleep during the bagats? You know what I'm talking about. And deuter, bagat, deuter, bagat, deuter, bagat, deuter, and you go, <sighs> right? This, I, I can't do it. I, I, we fall, but more challenging than that, just skip the bagats, it's fine. More challenging than that is reading things like the prophet Nahum. The prophet Nahum is this little short book where the guy just gloats about the fall of the capital city of Nineveh. Right? An entire city is destroyed, invaded, and destroyed, and he just gloats, and he talks about, you know, you had it coming. God got you. God was going to do you in. And to read about someone gloating about how much a person's, a city's life was destroyed, and then say, oh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I, I don't know how we do that. I don't know how to say thanks be to God for the prophet Nahum. That's N-A-H-U-M. Go home and read it. It's very disturbing. It'll take about four or five minutes to read, and it will mess with your head the rest of the day. All right. I don't know how to read that except to know that I'm going to struggle with it. And I think that's okay. Part of reading the whole series is acknowledging that this was written 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, in a different time, a different place. It will be hard, and there are times we're not going to understand. And the best image I can give you is, that, is to think of Jacob wrestling with an angel. If you remember the story, Jacob and Esau, they're brothers, they fight. Okay, so they're fighting a lot, and uh, Jacob tricks his brother out of his inheritance. And then he runs for his life because his brother Esau is going to kill him. And his mama says, you better run. Run, run, son. Here, go. And so he runs and he goes away and he's gone for 20 years. He, he get, two, uh, marries twice, comes back with a flock, uh, and, and he sends some of the flock ahead to sort of, here, Esau, we'll, we're cool now, right? And so in this process of coming back, at night when he is by himself, he has sent everyone else ahead, he finds himself wrestling with an angel. Right? And the funny thing about the word angel, like angel is the Hebrew word. A lot of the other terms, like the, the Hebrew word for king is melech. But when you read in, in the Bible, we read the word king, it says king, it doesn't say melech. Angel is the Hebrew word, and the translation of, of angel is messenger. One who brings the words of another, right? And, and so an angel is the one who brings the words of another, and so... Jacob is wrestling with the, the word of God that has come to him. Literally, like having a throwdown over this. And, and he is wrestling and wrestling, and what is, the angel says, you got to let me go. And, the, and Jacob says, and I love this, I will not let you go until you give me a blessing. And, and the angel touches his hip, throws his hip out of socket, and he has a hitch in his giddy-up for the rest of his life. That's what the blessing is. He walks differently from then on. Right? And I think that, is, that captures something. When I hit Nahum, or Nahum, that throws a hitch in my giddy-up. I'm not so confident about that I understand who God is or what, what's going on here. It confuses me. I struggle with it. 
If you go through the series, you're going to struggle with parts of it. That's the challenging part. But to be blessed is to be directed the way that God wants. I mean, we throw that word around. We call a dinner a blessing. It's a blessing because God wants us to eat together. Right? We call someone a blessing to us because they have done something that's in line with God's plan for us, God's desires. And so to say that we're going to struggle with the word of God until we are blessed by it, until we are in line with what God wants us to be thinking with it, that that's what we're trying to get at. And if it's a little bit challenging, and if it tumbles us, and if it challenges us, well, that's just the way it is. Centuries ago, Marcion's approach to the Bible was declared a heresy, but it still lives on, doesn't it? Right? Marcion said, let's ditch the Old Testament. I did a little, little online survey to see who all reads the Old Testament and not. Let me just tell you the short version of the results. Everyone reads all the New Testament, and then we don't far less of us read all of the, New, uh, the Old Testament. If you go online and go to like uh, Blue Letter Bible, the Bible Gateway, the online sites, you can look up what are the top verses people look for. And I have a print off of the top 100 verses that people read online. Of those top 100, how many of them are from the Old Testament? Yeah, 19. Most of them are Psalms. We just don't read the Old Testament. Every time you pick up a Bible, that is, you, ever, you know those Bibles that are, that are the New Testament and the Psalms? You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? That's not a Bible. Right? The Bible is the whole thing. The whole series. Every time you pick that up, every time someone sells one of those, Marcion wins. Right? Marcion lives on. That her heresy continues. And it continues, and we, if we have a shallower faith because we are not engaged with the entirety of the series, it shows up in how we live. And let me give you an example. In the Old Testament, one of the recurring themes again and again and again is that if you're going to care for the outcast and the stranger and the widow and the immigrant, like we see that in what Jesus says, right? You take care of the people who are needy. The Old Testament helps us have the understanding of who the needy are. We read things like Deuteronomy 10:19, You shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And to be a stranger in another land, you know what we call a stranger in another land today? There's a word for that. It starts with I, right? Immigrant. The Old Testament has this intense recurring focus that you are going to take care of and love immigrants because you are the immigrants that came out of Egypt. What, does it, what would it look like for America, a nation full of a lot of Christians, to love immigrants? But to get to that question, you got to read the Old Testament. You got to read the whole series. Got to read the whole book, right? My wife tells me about the Harry Potter series because she loves it, right? Loves it. And because she loves it, I'm going to read it too. I've read the first book and I am going to read the rest of them. It might not be today. But I will read them, if only to be able to read them with my children and to be able to share in that joy. It's gonna, I look forward to not, that, if nothing else. I'm going to read it because Olivia loves it and she tells me it's good and she's excited. In the same way, I want to tell you that to read the Bible, like, if I argue for you to read the Bible because it has the important information for, the good, for your soul and for your salvation, like, that's like arguing people into d doing their oil change every 5,000 miles. If I tell you you need to get your oil change every 5,000 miles, do you get excited about that? Okay, Andy, you're right. And remember to rotate your tires, right? That, that, that. Good job, Andy. You've told me the, the correct thing to do. I don't want you to read the Bible because you need to figure out how to get your spiritual oil change. I want you to read the Bible because it's wonderful. It's really good. It's exciting, it is powerful, and yes, there are some pages, it's not always a page turner, but there is meat in there that is so amazing. My understanding of heaven is based on reading Amos and just being able to follow his love of the land and the way that he describes heaven as a mountain upon which those who are sowing and those who are reaping, like their harvest is just so good that you can't get it all in before it's time to start a new harvest, uh, to, to, start, to start planting again. And that just 
image of a land that is luscious and the people who are doing good work and they are excited and they're just the bounty of the, that description that's powerful I don't it shapes how I imagine everything good in life I don't want you to read the Old Testament and all of Scripture because I'm worried about your souls I want you to read it because it is the most it is the most important book you could ever read you, is that clear? Did I any confusing there? <laughs> it's good. Read it. Amen.